morning. Welcome to Bridgehampton Presbyterian Church for our service for May the 22nd, which is titled The Weakest Link. Join me in a prayer. Speak to us, Lord. We need to learn your ways. Send your spirit. Take what we hear and write it upon our hearts, we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 16, and verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshipper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. And when she and her household were baptised, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Here ends our scripture reading for this morning. I wonder if any of you know a show on television, began a few years back around 2002, and it's called The Weakest Link. The original series made quite a star of its presenter, Anne Robinson, but there was a 2021 incarnation hosted on NBC here in the USA was hosted by Jane Lynch. Now, the format featured nine contestants who, in no particular order, took turns answering general knowledge questions. The objective of every round was to create a chain of nine correct answers in a row and earn an increasing amount of money within a time limit. One wrong answer broke the chain and lost any money earned. I was never a regular watcher, but I recall sitting down with my wife Yvonne to watch a show one evening and it had a contestant and they were asked a biblical question. Matthew, Mark, Luke and please give the name of the fourth book in the series. The contestants answered. Job. Matthew, Mark, Luke and Job? Of course it's John. Now, I love the book of Job, but he was the guy tempted by Satan to give up on God, not the much-loved disciple and companion of Jesus after whom the fourth gospel is named. Biblical knowledge, then and now, can be the weakest link in many people's lives. And that's not good news for our society. We're told that we have grown more materialistic and our hunger for spiritual things has actually increased. But people are turning to other places than the Christian scriptures to fill their spiritual wells. The reading we heard just now from the book of Acts gave the history of Paul's outreach to Macedonia. And the account of Lydia and her household becoming Christian. At first glance, it seems nothing more than one of those someone preaches, 
Someone gets saved, the gospel spreads, yada, 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 yada. Heard it all before. Accounts. But there's more to it than that. I mean, think about the struggle the early Jewish church had in reaching out to the Gentiles. It was an action that went against everything their Jewish heritage had taught them. It was unclean. There were Jews, there were Gentiles, and that was the way it was meant to be. Not anymore, Jesus had showed them. And they struggled to comprehend what it meant to go into the entire world and make disciples. They became reliant on the, the work of the Holy Spirit to direct and lead them. And they developed a proven system of doing things. They would set out on their journeys and when the opportunity arose, usually on the Sabbath, they'd go to the synagogue. And there in the synagogue, relate the message that Jesus, the promised Messiah, had come. It was easy. Well, not that easy, but there was a pattern. Go to town, go to synagogue, preach the good news. And then Paul has this dream of a man pleading, Come to Macedonia! It's one of those striking moments of insight that gets his soul bubbling. He knows it's the right thing to do and he convinces those who are with him to be a part of it. Come on guys, let's go. So they head to Macedonia and to the capital city, Philippi. They hadn't visited Philippi before, but they knew the drill. Go to the city, go to the synagogue, preach. But Philippi wasn't like other places they had been. Philippi was a little slice of Rome, beyond Rome. And the people who lived there were Roman through and through. And like many expatriate communities, the Romans in Philippi were more entranced with Rome than many of the Romans who lived in Rome. In fact, they were so Roman, they did not have a single synagogue in the whole city. Lots of temples to other gods, but no synagogue. Claudius, the emperor at that time, didn't particularly like the Jewish people. So in this Roman city of Roman cities beyond Rome, you could forget about a synagogue. I don't know if Paul was aware of that. You can almost picture him and those with him getting into town. They're wandering around and around. And of course, being guys, the last thing they're going to do is stop and ask for directions. We'll get there. We'll find it. God's on our side. Eventually, in their frustration, they stop a bystander. Hey, buddy, um, can you give us some directions to the synagogue? And the man just laughs at them. Synagogue? You've got to be joking. Where are you guys from? A Philippian synagogue. Hey, that's a good one, you guys. What next? A woman emperor? God save the queen? As if. So there they are. We go, we go to town, we go to the synagogue, we preach. Lord, there's no synagogue here. Now what do we do? What they do is, as the Sabbath comes round, they head down to the riverside. You know, sometimes a little walk by the river and a prayer can do wonders for the soul. When they get there, all they find is a bunch of women who were probably washing clothes. Gentiles, remember, didn't observe the Jewish Sabbath. For them, it was just another day to get things done. Later in his life, Paul would write that in Christ, male and female were one. But this Paul, down by the river, was still carrying with him an upbringing and a prejudice that made him see women as second-class citizens. Maybe it was one of these women down by the riverside that changed his views forever. The disciples sit down on the grass nearby and they engage the ladies in conversation. And one of them, by 
the name of Lydia starts showing a real interest. This Lydia, far from being unimportant, is a prominent citizen within Philippi's community. A dealer in purple cloth, a trade which would bring in a significant income. Women in Roman society were not restricted, as were those in Judaism. And God speaks to Lydia through Paul's words. This Jesus he spoke of was not so much the weakest link, but certainly the missing link in her spiritual journey. Lydia was no lame brain in the things of religion, but her beliefs, and we don't know exactly what they were, couldn't give her the life that Paul was explaining to her. So she accepts, along with her household, Paul's invitation to be baptised. And then insists that Paul and his companions stay at her home as her guest. Their mission now has a centre from which to expand. So, while this talk about the mission to, to Philippi and Lydia, what was the significance of this particular incident? Well, Lydia and her household were the first Europeans to accept the gospel message. From this incident, Christianity would grow to become the official religion of Rome. And after the fall of Rome, the European continent. And many years later, some Christian folk underground persecution were motivated to settle in a new land where they could express their beliefs freely. And their faith was a driving factor. Such were the first Europeans to settle in North America. And looking at the chain, it, it might never have happened had not one lady, Lydia, accepted Christ as her saviour and welcomed Christ's servants into her home. Had Paul put his vision of a Macedonian calling out for help on hold or put it down to too much cheese for supper, the message would not have spread in the way it would do in the centuries that followed. This story of Lydia is one of the links in the chain that forms our history and our heritage. The passage also teaches us about the way God can direct our lives by the Holy Spirit. If you read the verses before our text, you'll see that Paul has been having a challenging time. He's set out on his mission with great enthusiasm and a lot of success. But right then, rather than opening before him, doors were closing wherever he went. They wanted to go to Asia, but as the scripture puts it, the Holy Spirit forbade them. They decided to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. It's as though they're waiting at the traffic light, it changes to green, they put their foot on the gas and then it jumps back to red again before they've got a chance to move. I remember going through that torturous process of seeking where God might be leading us that culminated in our family emigrating to this land. For a while, I really didn't know where we were headed. I didn't know we, no, we weren't supposed to stay where we were. I'd applied to a church down in Louisiana. Things were looking good. They flew me over for an interview. And from the moment I stepped off the plane, I bonded with them like they were old friends or family. The visit went really well. A couple of them even sent letters to say, wow, we had such a great time. Thank you so much. But about two weeks afterwards, it seemed every time I turned on the TV or radio or picked something up to read, it had something to do with Louisiana. Turn on the radio. Now get some Cajun music from a Louisiana band called. 
Here's Louisiana's rock and roller, Jerry Lee Lewis. I put on the TV. Now, the travel program. Today we go to Mardi Gras. No! Dallas comes on. Change the channel. And there's JR. JR, we've got a problem with one of our wells over the border in Louisiana. It was weird. We even gave our dog Lucy a second name, Anna. Just so we could shout down the road, come on, Louisiana! <laughs> Lord, that smile. It's good to know. Where are you leaving us? And then one night, the telephone rang. It was Louisiana. We're sorry. You didn't get the job. Boy, were my navigation systems out of line. Wham! That door crashed to a close. I didn't understand it. Everything was falling into place. And then slam! I went to bed thinking, oh, I guess I'm just restless. Maybe it's God's way of saying I should stay exactly where I am. But a few nights later, I had a most vivid dream. If I shut my eyes, I can still see it. It was our minister belonging to my old denomination, a minister who had been instrumental in founding the church that had brought me to faith. And this old minister was standing in his room and he had a picture on his wall of America. And he was pointing to it and saying, you're not going to back out now, are you? It was only a dream, but it remains more vivid in my mind than some real life experiences I've had. And it was after that I sent off a couple more letters and ended up in the unlikely setting of Fayetteville, West Virginia. And since then, as a family, we've experienced many other adventures and wonderful places and people to have given up after receiving a don't go there phone call from Louisiana would have created a huge missing link in our life journey. We'd certainly never be here in this beautiful place. So, I urge you, don't let the things of God and your response to God's love and leadings be the weakest link in your life. You can go and pursue your dreams, rise to the top of your chosen career, lay on your deathbed as a millionaire and remain completely outside the will of God. The link you don't want to miss is linking your life to the love of God. Jesus has made this link possible through his death on the cross. His Holy Spirit can guide you. His word can direct your path. But you must embrace it and allow yourself to be embraced by God. Hmm. A lady called Lydia became the first Christian in Europe and through her actions became a link to the expansion of the faith throughout the known world. Paul was faithful to the dream God planted in his soul. Inspired by such examples, may faith never become the weakest link in our hearts and our lives. And to God's name be all honour, praise and glory. Amen. And join me for a moment in prayer. Lord, we confess that our faith can sometimes be the weakest link in our relationship to you. We question your ways, we doubt your guidance. We thank you for those times your grace has enabled us to move beyond our doubts and discover you haven't abandoned us, but are standing with us through the challenges we face. So help us to hold on to you, to trust that when we fall, you can pick us up again and teach us something from our failings. We pray, Lord, for a better understanding of your grace. We pray for the sort of love to be in our hearts 
that looks to the needs of others more than it looks to serving itself. For we know of many around us who are bowed down under the weight of life's troubles. Sickness and injury, addiction and despair, breakdown in relationships, the pain of loss and bereavement, all these sap people's strength and take away their childlike joy. And so at this time we offer to you concerns that are upon our hearts. Your, your word is clear. The task upon us who claim to follow Jesus is immense. Called to bring joy where there is mourning, peace where there's no peace, love where there is only animosity, healing where there is only pain, forgiveness where there are those who cannot forgive themselves, light where darkness reigns. Equip us through your Holy Spirit to face the challenge of these days. Enable our leaders in church and nations to discover your will and have the courage to be embraced by it. Raise up your people among all the nations that the light of Christ may shine upon us all. In particular, we lift up the nation of Ukraine as she travels through days of conflict. Lay upon us your hands of blessing that we may take your love to others in the strength of your Holy Spirit and to the glory of the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we join in prayer using the words he taught his children to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us online for our service from Bridgehampton. Again, I pray that the weakest link in your life will not be your connection with God. May rather through his spirit and through what Christ has done for us, may you find hope and joy and peace and love that strengthens you for days ahead. So now go in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and let the people say, Amen. <laughs>